Welcome to the 150th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Arik Davis, author of the 1980s coming-of-age novel, The Fort. Stay tuned for the interview. Also for this 150th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast, I wanted to announce the podcast first sponsor, Riffle. The Reading and Writing Podcast is sponsored by the book-loving nerds at Riffle. Riffle is an online book community that connects readers with authors and books that they'll love. Readers use Riffle to find the next book that they want to read, and authors use Riffle to make their books stand out and drive sales. Join the Riffle community now at rifflebooks.com. That's R-I-F-F-L-E-B-O-O-K-S dot com, and I will have a link to that on my website and in the show notes of the podcast. Again, that's rifflebooks.com. Stay tuned for my interview with Eric Davis. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Arik Davis. Arik is the author of several thrillers, mystery, and horror novels. His latest novel, The Fort, is available in bookstores now. Arik, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Sure, sure. Well, can you read the first couple of pages of your new novel, The Fort? Yeah, no problem. The fort was made out of scrap wood that had been harvested from Stan Benchley's old deck by his son, Tim, after the deck had been torn down to be replaced by a patio. Tammy Benchley, Tim's mother and Stan's wife, had decided once Stan decided mid-project was a fit of madness that her husband could install a patio without professional help. Stan, a teacher by trade and a man who very much valued his summer vacations, found the task to be much harder than his wife had told him it would be. The weather was hot as well, and it quickly became clear to Stan that he'd be suffering in the heat of the sun for nearly an entire summer, digging out the earth, replacing it with pea gravel, and slowly leveling the stone patio pavers. By contrast, Tim and his friends Scott and Luke had their project finished much faster. The fort was roughly 20 feet off the floor of what the boys thought of as the forest, what most adults in the area thought of as the eyesore. The base of the fort was made by attaching strapped 4x4s four by, four by fours to three trimmed pine trees growing within a few feet of each other. The boys were able to place these boards by building ladders into the trees using pieces of cut-up 2x4s, also scrapped, of course. Using the 4x4s four as their attachment point, the boys slowly made the floor of the fort out of more scrapped 2x4s, measuring, cutting, and then attaching each floorboard to the tops of the 4x4s. Four the first of these three trees was the thickest, and rather than build the fort over the base and were difficult to create a shape, the boys used this larger tree to span as near as possible to the width of the other two. This early step in engineering, suggested by Tim's dad, made the shape of the fort's floor closer to a trapezoid than a square and helped utilize both the strengths and the positions of the three trees to maximum advantage. The walls of the fort had been clutched together from a mixture of 4x4s four and a forgotten stack of treated plywood that had been left to rot after a project from another summer, a period Stan Benchley still referred to as the year of the shed. The plywood had windows sawed into it at heights appropriate for the boys to look through and allowed incredible sight lines into the rarely trespassed patch of trees. When it was finished on June 29, 1987, the fort's floor was 8 feet by 10 feet, give or take an inch or two. Three separate ladders led up to it, one up each tree, and walls a foot taller than the tallest boy, Scott, 5 feet 5 inches, stood to protect them. Windows with crude shutters had been cut into the walls, and a roof was over their heads to protect them from the elements. The roof and walls were afterthoughts, but it was hard to tell due to the unlikely, but really quite skilled construction work done by the three boys. That's the, uh, just shy of the first two pages of it. After that, it starts uh, moving on to the actual plot of it. The force, the fort of the title is, of course, just a place where things happen in the book. Great. Well, if someone listening hasn't heard about the fort yet, how would you describe the novel? Uh, it's a coming-of-age novel about three boys. Um, trying to help a girl who's been kidnapped by a, a serial killer. Right. And with um, with a coming-of-age novel set in the summer of 1987, what, what was it like writing about that time period? While, while it's really not that long ago, just the technology is vastly different. No iPads, no internet, and MTV was still playing music videos. What, what was it um, like when you went back to try to recreate that period in the setting? Well, it was it was a blast, honestly. That was when I grew up was the 1980s. So these boys are just a little bit older than I would have been at the point when the story takes place. So it was cool to be able to to play with the same kind of like look back that uh, Stephen King did so well with the body or that Joe R. Lansdale does in a lot of his books where they're playing with the the mid 50s where they grew up. It was the same kind of thing for me to get to to dance around in my own childhood and, 
put put a story in the same kind of you know shenanigan type world that I lived in. Uh, albeit, of course, I didn't have the serial killer, thank goodness, and kidnap girl or any of that stuff. But I <laughs> I certainly got to play out the same kind of games that these kids did. Sure. The, the other part of it that was so fun to write with by writing into the past was uh, I, I hate that moment. And, and, and it's always in horror movies, especially where the phones don't work anymore. <laughs> so it was nice to be able to have a world where the phones already didn't work and not have to worry about, you know, shutting off the cell phones for everybody. It was, it was cool. I, it, there's definitely a different dynamic to telling a story in that era than there is now, especially when it comes to police procedural stuff. You know, the the way evidence is collected, the way DNA is treated. Is very different than it was just a short time ago. Sure, sure. Well, with your three main characters in the Ford, did you have a favorite character that you liked writing about? I liked writing about the the Tim character quite a bit, and I liked writing about the detective quite a bit. Um, the bad guy character, Matt Hooper, was... I hate to say fun to write about, but he was fun to write about in a really like kind of sick kind of way, like just to take the stuff that I've done as far as reading with the background of a person like that and put it into a fictional character is, I don't know. It's always a little rough and tumble, but there's a certain joy to be had in that too. But definitely writing about the boys was my favorite part. Sure. Sure. Well, I know from your, your biography and and reading some interviews with you that that you worked for many years as a body piercer. I'm, I'm curious, were you always interested in writing during that time when you were working as a body piercer and what led you to writing your first novel? Um, I, I was never really interested in writing. I, I loved reading for as long as I can remember. That was always just, you know, I'm sure it is for you too, just a thing that seems like it was always a part of my life. And, uh, I got this basically like a, something stuck in your tooth, you know, a piece of popcorn stuck in my tooth about the idea of writing a book. And so I, I decided I was going to try and do it. And I wrote a book and of course no one wanted to buy it. And <laughs> I ended up self, I ended up self publishing it, selling like a pathetically small amount of copies. And then after that, just kept writing more and more stuff, whether it was, you know, short stories or stuff for different blogs. And then, after writing six uh, manuscripts, I finally managed to sell something. And what was the one that you managed to sell the first time? Uh, it's a YA mystery novel called Nickel Plated about this 12-year-old detective slash drug dealer. Um, basically like solving little like violent cases in his hometown. <laughs> <laughs> And so, so before you were published and, and you were writing your first stories and, and, and novels, were there writers that you read at the time that you either loved their books and, and, and their books were somewhat of an inspiration to you in writing, or you wanted to emulate their careers? Pretty much anybody at that point that had published anything, I wanted to emulate their career. But the, <laughs> <laughs> the, the writers that I've enjoyed... Um, a, a small number of the writers that I've enjoyed over the years and, and really, really admired would be guys like uh, Stephen King and Joe Lansdale that I already mentioned. I'm a huge fan of uh, Dennis Lehane. I think Gillian Flynn is an incredible author. Um, he writes horribly slowly, but George R.R. Martin is a f- fantastic author that I, I wish could could spew it out a little bit faster. Um <laughs> Andrew Andrew Vox is a, a huge hero of mine. The, the work that he's done outside of just writing is incredible um, to, to think about the many lives that he's touched. And of course the list goes on and on and on and on, sure, but that's sure. a few of them. And, and given your success to date with, uh, with the novels that you've published, what, what advice do you have for aspiring writers who may be listening, who would one day like to have their own novels or short stories published? Well, they're going to hate it. Um, the advice is just keep writing. And that was the advice that I kept getting from people that had broken through. And I hated that advice because, well, of course I'm going to keep writing, you know, what are you talking about? And that's, that's really the key is you just have to keep, you know, pounding the keyboard and and just do it over and over and over and over again. And hopefully if you do that, you'll get lucky eventually because it really takes the two things. I think you need to have that writing muscle overwork to this just ridiculous point. And then you also have to be lucky enough to get your work in front of somebody. I mean, there are probably tens of thousands of authors that are better than myself or many other people that are published that their work will never see the light of day just because they won't have the the luck of having an editor and agent actually look at their work. I mean, it, it takes both and you need to be writing a lot to 
put yourself in a position where someone might eventually see it and you need to be writing a lot. So if they do actually see your work, it's worth them taking a look at. Sure. Sure. And, and kind of what kept you going? I mean, I know that you, that you self published and, and, um, you know, went through, through many years, what kept you going? Was it just the love of writing? That was a lot of it. Um, my wife was very helpful with it. Um, as far as keeping me focused and keeping me, keeping my spirits high. And I mean, we were getting, so many rejections that it was insane. Like, cause I'd get a new writer's market every year, go through it, go to all the websites for all the different uh, agents and editors, writer's market for anybody listening that doesn't know is this phone book, like tome of uh, all the contact information that you could ever want of people that oddly, even though they put their names in there, really don't want to talk to you for the most part. <laughs> so <laughs> I'd go through that and read all these websites. We do basically cyber stock, you know, hundreds of agents and editors and then write as many query letters to try to get them to notice me and read my work as possible. And we would be getting just stacks of these rejections in the mail that and my wife would hand them to me every day and be like, here's your rejections. And I'd get them from work. Here, here's your rejections today. And of course, my email box is getting flooded with the same rejections. It ended up being right around 400 in total over the, the years of sending stuff out. Wow. But yeah, my, my wife and my parents and my daughter were all incredibly helpful in terms of keeping me focused, reminding me that... I liked writing and that was why I was doing it. And maybe I'd get published, but I wasn't writing to get published. I was writing to write. That, that's great. Um, and, and what was the, what was the, the, the moment like when you finally got uh, an agent who, who responded positively? It was actually my editor before. I still don't have an agent. I've okay. been talking to a guy the last couple of weeks. So maybe that won't be true by the time this goes out. But anyways, um, it was, it was so jaw dropping to the point that I thought I was being like scammed. Mm -hmm. Like I, I didn't take it seriously at all. I immediately Googled the man that had contacted me my editor, Terry Goodman, I Googled him and was like, Oh my God, this is legit. I can't believe this. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I carried my laptop upstairs and sent it for my wife. And I was like, I would, I felt shell shocked. I mean, I, I, it was, it's hard to, to think about it now as something that actually happened. And it's been, almost four years. And yeah, it was just insane. Like it totally, totally blew me away. And then it, of course it was legit. And we talked on the phone a couple of days later and he reassured me that everything was good and <laughs> still, still crazy to think about. That's great. That's a great story. So, so were you, were you self publishing electronically or was this prior to, to kind of the, the widespread um, uh, ebook self publishing that's going on now? When I self-published, it was right before the ebook thing really took off. Um, mm -hmm. It was certainly like happening. I probably could have published electronically, but I chose just to publish like a physical addiction, uh, edition of a book called From Ashes Rise and sold about 200 copies of it before I took it out of print. And when it does go on Amazon now, it goes for like a ton of money and it's horribly written and horribly edited. And I feel super bad for anybody that is spending a lot of money on it to read it because it's not very good. But I suppose that they're getting it for collectible they can do worse i've thought about re-releasing it electronically it's just it would take so much work as far as editing goes that i'm not sure it's worth the effort at this point when i've already always got some other project that i'm working on that's new sure um and have you dabbled in any self-publishing electronically i haven't i've thought about putting out some of my short stories that way mm -hmm. um or even like manuscripts that kind of fell by the wayside when i was submitting other stuff but again the editing process and just everything about that is is really daunting. I I feel really spoiled that I get to work with such amazing people at my publisher that it, it it seems difficult to to do it on my own. I know it'd be incredibly easy, but it still seems difficult. Sure, sure. Um, so what are you working on now? Um, I just finished a uh, novel, or um, I suppose a manuscript right now because it's still in dormant form, but uh, a manuscript about a 16-year-old girl trying to solve a... Uh, a murder that happened 15 years prior. And it's just like her adventure is trying to unravel this situation that happened, you know, a decade and a half before she even knew about it. Gotcha. Um, and I know we talked about authors uh, earlier in this interview, but are there any books that you've read in like the last two or three months that really stood out for you that you would recommend? Yeah. And it's, it's funny that we were just talking about self-publishing because this one is a self-published book. Um, it's a sci-fi novel called Wool that was released uh, in parts. And I just read the anthology of the like first five bits of it. 
and it's just phenomenal. I mean, it's about these people living in this post-apocalyptic situation in this gigantic underground tube, and it's incredible. If you haven't read it, you should totally read it. It was I'm not the biggest sci-fi fan. I'm not the biggest fantasy fan, but some of those books transcend the genre, like uh, Ice and Fire, like I mentioned earlier. Sure. And that book, Wool, is one of them. It is just phenomenal. That's great. That's great. Anything else come to mind? Um, I'm trying to think of books I've read recently. I, and if not, it's no big deal. Yeah, I, I tore through that one. I should, yeah, yeah. should just fire up my Kindle and that'll <laughs> tell me what I've read recently. No, that that's fine. So so where can people find you online if they're interested in learning more about you and your books? Um, uh, Amazon.com, ericdavis.com would be the two easiest spots. I'm horrible at updating my blog. So every now and again, I'll toss something on there. But if people want to read some really meandering, random stuff posted over the last three years, that'd probably be the spot. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Arik Davis, author of The Fort. Arik, thanks for doing this interview. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jeff. Have a nice afternoon.